We analyze Mozilla Rhino, that is one of the systems that we use in our experimentation, and we observe that this identifier is one with the highest term entropy and the highest context coverage. And boy, D. What does it mean? And boy, D. So let's guess. Well, we searched for uh, a meaning of this identifier and we observed that M boy D is actually this one <laughs> <laughs> that is the nickname of one of the most active contributors of Rhino. There is something wrong here. And in reality, what we discovered is uh, an error in uh, our tool that computes the term entropy and context coverage that the, this error, uh, actually our tool did not discard correctly some comments and specifically the comments where you put the name of uh, the author and this guy is almost on all the entities the number of occurrences of this term of course is one for each entity so when you compute the entropy, this entropy is very high the context coverage of course is very high so the error prone identifier is just the name of a developer <laughs> well the problem is that uh, correlation in our paper we assume that correlation imply causation and this is wrong correlation does not imply causation Actually, we focused just on numbers, we did not find uh, any example, and this is the result. This was one of my first errors with the empirical study. I did not put the emphasis on uh, the qualitative analysis of the result, just a quantitative analysis of the result, just number. But I was not able to justify the result that I achieved applying a statistical test. We are still finding uh, an error prone identifier. Probably we'll get some uh, good news in the next 10 years, I don't know. But we are still working on that. So if you are interested in doing your PhD, this could be a topic. Uh, but this is not the only just event that, there's not just an event that. Uh, uh, change the way I approach the discipline. Another paper that actually contributes to my uh, uh, change in the relationship between empirical software engineering is this one. That is, failure is a four letter word, a party of empirical research. That is a paper by Andreas Zell, Tom Zimmerman, and Chris Berg. So, uh, three people, three researchers that actually did some work in empirical uh, software engineering and presented this paper to Promist in 2011. This paper is fantastic uh, and uh, I think that this is the paper that every student should read before starting during empirical studies. Which is the context of this paper? Defect prediction once again. And the idea is to define a simple easy to implement method to predict and avoid, important, and avoid failure in software system. So instead of using uh, CK matrix, instead of using term entropy context coverage, I want something that is very simple to measure, that can be used as a predictor for defect, but can be also used to avoid the presence of defect. Which is the idea? Well, I can use programmer actions that are the key strokes used to create source code. So when you have to code, you have to press some key, of course. These are your actions. I can use this action in order to predict the presence of defect. Specifically, what can I do? I can represent a source code entity <coughs> as a vector of uh, 256 uh, elements where each element 
representing the, the number of occurrences of a specific character represented by his ASCII code. Okay? Simple. In reality, you don't need to measure key actions or program an action. You just need to count the number of character in your source code. Then you can use this representation uh, in a ma in machine learning uh, technique. In the case of the outer logistic regression, you can build, in other words, a model for predicting defect based on this representation of the source code. And this approach is able to see to see to is able to say that your code is defect free or defect prone. So using this representation. That is the number of character in of specific character in user's code. I can predict the presence of defect. Wow, very easy to, to, to implement. Probably uh, counting the number of different characters in a text file is one of the first exercises that we assign to the stu computer science student. So, first course of programming, you can ask the student count the number of different characters. Simplest way to measure the presence of defect. Of course, they present an empirical study following the, the template, by Boolean, of course, uh, experimental design, experimental variable, blah, 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 blah. A lot of statistics. First finding, program elections, Servant excellent defect predictors with a precision up to 74 and a recall up to 32%. Wow. Good. But the second finding, most, most important, is that the results show a strong correlation between specific program directions. So <laughs> keystrokes I, R, O, P, and defects. What does it mean? If you use in your code I, R, O, P, be careful, because probably you are introducing a defect. <laughs> <laughs> but what can I say? I can make the result actionable. In which way? I can prevent defect by doing something like that. A nice keyboard where I can highlight with different color which are the key that you cannot use during your programming activities. Don't touch red button. <laughs> well, but as you can see, there are some nasty programmers, so this is a soft solution. There is another solution that we can apply, that is this one. Well, we have fixed all the problems that we have in this community. Using this keyboard, all your programs are defect free. <laughs> there is something that is wrong here. And uh, the problem is that, once again, correlations do not mean causations. The problem is that if you look at this paper, and this is part of the paper, because at the end, the authors explain it, why the empirical study is not correct, is a completely nonsense. The numbers correlation reported are all true findings, are correct. The correlation exists, of course, but it's the interpretation that is wrong. And they did a great job because in the first part of the paper, they talk about programmer actions, but at the end, programmer actions are just characters that are in your source code. And of course, there is no correlation, there is no causation between the, the, the usage of specific character and the presence of defect. And there is an important sense in this paper that is the widespread availability of the empirical data in software engineering has brought an explosion of findings, a lot of findings, many of them substantial, but some of them banal at best and misleading at worst. The problem here is that numbers are just numbers. And if you base 
your findings just on p values or effect size or statistics, you are probably missing the point. And you can derive some findings that are completely nonsense. Is this the end of the relationship with the empirical software engineering? No. It's just the event that pushes me to change the interpretation of this discipline and how do I use empirical methods. And specifically, I realize that empirical methods are just tools. The focus should be on the experiment idea, on the method, on the tool. And this is the start of the age of maturity. So, from this point, we will start talking on how to use properly empirical methods and how to use empirical methods to validate idea. It was in 2010. A new PhD, a new PhD student of my group started this uh, adventure. We were in Timisoara at ICSM in 2010. This is Eddie Marcus, you probably know. This is me. And the guy that started the PhD is this one. Do you know him? Gabriel. <laughs> it's Gabriel Bamoda that he actually attended this first conference. Well, I can say this. No? Gabriele is not here. <laughs> well, Gabriele is uh, one of the best students that I have. Uh, I have, and probably the best student that I have. If you want to become a professor in a university, just find a PhD student like Gabriele. It's the game is done. Uh, if you find a couple of students like Gabriele, well, you can risk to win the Turing Prize. Um, Gabriele is a, an outstanding student. This is a message for you, Simone. Eh? That you, that you, you have to do better than him, of course. And Gabriele started his PhD on software refactoring. Software refactoring. What is software refactoring? It's the process of changing a software in such a way that it does not alter the external behavior of the code and improves its external structure. So with refactoring, you are spending your time changing the code, improving non-functional requirements, uh, but without changing functional requirements. Why I need refactoring? If you know the uh, first lemma law of software evolution, you probably know that during software evolution, changes cause a lift on the original design, reducing its pooling. So you change the code today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and so on. Uh, very often you make such changes on time pressure, so you forget all the notions that you have acquired during your computer science program or object-oriented programming and so on. You put your code uh, without thinking on how should be written, but you think just to be uh, providing new functional requirements. At the end of this, of, of this operation, you obtain a code that is poorly organized. Max said this morning, talk about uh, software remodularization, where you have to change your architecture because the cohesion and coupling are not good. But the why low quality is a problem? Well, one of the main problems when you're doing a PhD on software refactoring, but also when you propose to your manager to refactor your system, is convince your manager to give you money in order to improve the code without providing functional requirements. Because for a manager, it's important to, that developers implement new functional requirements so I can get some money from the new version of the, of the, the system. If you say to your manager that, look, I want to work on this project for one month without providing any new functionalities, but don't worry, the code looks better at the end, probably your manager say, you probably need to find another job. But you can convince your manager that if you spend some time in improving the quality 
of the design of your system, you can improve also the productivity because there are empirical studies that uh, analyze the correlation between bad quality code and the lower productivity. Greater reward, so uh, a lot of uh, time spent to redoing the same thing, and more significant effort. So, if we improve the quality of the code, we can uh, do better in the future. There are a lot of refactoring operations, some guidelines given by, by Fowler in his book Refactoring, that is another book that uh, I think every programmer should read because it's very funny, because you can find there your mistakes. Oh, no, this one, I made this mistake a couple of years ago. Oh, oh I also made this mistake. Because Fowler actually presented you a lot of mistakes that we did as programmer and provide you also the solution. So how can you do better? There are more than 90 refactory operations defined in this, in this catalog. Some of them are very simple and some of them are very difficult, complex. Uh, simple are, if you think, that, for instance, rename a method, you need to change the name of a method in order to improve the compensability, for instance. Other approaches are, other refactoring operations are more complex. For instance, extract class, extract method, method, new class, and so on. For instance, suppose that you have a class like that, that is a real class, uh, taken from uh, one of the Apache project. As you can see, it's a very big class. Okay. Uh, Look at the scrolling bar. This class has almost uh, probably more or less 100 instance variables and more than 100 methods. So, suppose that you have to do a maintenance task here. Good luck. You will probably spend uh, one month in order to just comprehend half of this uh, responsibility, half of the responsibility of this class. In order to improve the maintainability, this class are called it, uh, in general co-op or God class because actually concentrate the logical application of uh, a software system and are clearly hard to maintain because in order to work on this class you have to comprehend the class and this class is not so easy to comprehend. A way to make the blob more maintainable, you can perform an extra class refactor. A blob is a class that uh, has many responsibilities, so what you can do is just split the blob in different classes with more specific responsibility. Remember that object-oriented programming is a responsibility-based programming, so just one responsibility for each class. Well, extra class refactoring is, e is easy. Well, a way to extract correctly classes from one blob is to Try all the different combination. Uh, you need to extract all the possible way to extract classes from the blob, and select the one that provides you the highest quality in terms, for instance, of collision and coupling. If you just take to um, design your collision and coupling. If you have a, a blob that is small with ten methods and five attributes. You probably can try all the possible combinations because all the possible combinations of these 10 methods and 5 attributes is just this number. This is quite manageable. But of course, this class is not a blob. A blob is not a class at all. 10 methods, 5 instance variable. This is a blob. 100 methods and 100 attributes. And the possible way I can factor this block is this number that is a little bit higher than the previous one. That is equal to the answer who's composing the observable universe. So it's something that is not manageable, of course. <laughs> well, in this case, you need a semi-automatic approach. Or you need something that gives you some guidelines, some uh, information on how to correctly split the blob. And Gabriele developed this approach that is based on graph theory. The idea is very simple. Gabriele is not here, so I can say that it's simple. 
<laughs> for you, but probably it's not so, it's not so simple. Uh, you have a class here that is a block. You can build starting from this block a matrix that we call a method by method matrix. We have method here, method here. The generic entry of this matrix gives the probability that two methods should be put together. Because our idea is I need to identify a relationship between methods in order to put together similar methods. So I need a way to measure the similarity between methods. The similarity or the likelihood that this method should be put together in the same class. How I compute this uh, um, similarity, this, this, uh, this, uh, this similarity, yes, using three different measures that are the structural similarity between methods. So I can measure the similarity between, uh, between methods by considering the number of shared instance variables. The eigen the number of shared instance variables, the eigen is the similarity between the two methods. So this means that the two methods work on the same variable, so probably has the same responsibility. The code-based interaction between methods, that is a similarity based on calls. If the two methods call each other, you probably need to put the two methods in the same class. Otherwise, if you split this method, you increase the coupling between the classes. And there is also the concept of similarity between methods, that is inspired by a um, cohesion matrix proposed by Dennis, that is the conceptual cohesion of classes, that measure the similarity between, between two methods, uh, considering the textual content of the two, me two methods. So, so, in other words, we uh, compute the vocabulary uh, overlap between the two methods. The eigen the similarity between the two methods, the eigen is the number of uh, similar variables in the two methods, the eigen is the probability that the two methods talk about the same thing. Oh, sorry. Of course, I would like to have here um, a value between 0 and 1, a probability. Uh, all these measures have a value between 0 and 1. So, the simplest way to combine these metrics is using a weighted sum. So, we assign a weight, a weight to each measure and we compute the sum of this measure. Once we have the method by method matrix, we can filter the matrix. Why we need to filter the matrix? Because we need to remove spurious relationship between methods. You can have two methods that talk of different things. So, the two methods do not share any instance variable, do not call each other, but by chance they just um, share the name of one variable. Okay? When you compute the structural similarity, you obtain zero because zero is the number of shared variable. When you compare, when you compute the whole basic interaction, you obtain zero because zero is the number of the code. But when you compare the conceptual similarity, you obtain something that is higher, higher than zero probably 0 0.1, something like that. A very low value, but not zero. In order to remove this relationship, we apply a filter here in order to remove a spurious relationship due to the presence of a conceptual similarity measure. Once obtained the filter, the method by method the matrix, we compute the transitive closure. In other words, we identify chain of strongly related methods. Okay? In this example, you can see here, this is the first chain, where there is an eye similarity between these methods, another chain here, another chain here. Okay? These are candidate classes, but as you can see in this example, we have here a, a class with just one method. Hmm. This, this is not good, so the second step of the approach is to identify the best house for this uh, this method. And specifically, we go put the similarity between chain number 3 with the chain number 1 and chain number 2, and put chain number 3 and match chain number 3 with the most similar chain, in order to avoid very simple, very simple uh, 
very very simple class. Okay, this is the approach. If you want to know some detail, you can find the detail of this approach on uh, in the paper, of course. But here, the focus is on how to evaluate this method. Well, the first problem we have is the parameter tuning. When I explain the, the method, I say that we need to filter the matrix, so we need uh, to define which is the best threshold to filter the matrix, and uh, I also talk about weights for the different measures that we use to compute the likelihood that the two methods should be put in the same class. In other words, we need to define these two parameters. Which is the idea? Which was the idea? Well, our goal is to identify the parameter configuration of the proposed approach to provide the best results. The idea was simple. Take a block. Refactor it using a specific parameter configuration. Hmm? Repeat with different configurations and compare the result. The configuration that gives you the best result is the best configuration. In order to do such an experiment, what do we need? First of all, we need blobs. And we don't need just one blob or two blobs. We need a quite large number of blobs in order to generalize our result. A strategy for valuing the configuration parameter, but this is easy. And also, we need a matrix for comparing the different refactoring operations because we look here the best result, which are for me the best results. So I need to measure the result in order to say this result is better than this other. In order to identify blobs and to create blobs, we use this approach. That is an approach inspired by mutation testing. Specifically, what do we need? We need a large set of blobs. We take from a system a set of classes, two or three. Classes that are very different from each other, so with different responsibility, and also classes with high quality. We can measure the quality in terms, for instance, of cohesion and coupling. We can select the classes with high cohesion and no coupling. Once selected these classes, we match them together in order to obtain a blob. Because by definition, a blob is a class with different responsibility. Okay? Once obtained this artificial blob that we obtain and merge together classes with high quality, what we need? We use our approach in order to split the artificial blob. Then we compare the splitted class with the original classes in order to see how our approach is able to reconstruct from the blob the original classes. Okay? And using such an approach, we have also a method to measure the accuracy of our approach, the reconstruction accuracy. That is the Mojo FM measure that is used to measure two different partitions and give you an idea, an, an, an idea on how similar are two different partitions. In other words, if the motion frame is 100, the two partitions are identical. Using this approach, we uh, 